So I'd like to welcome you to bring escape rooms into your school with um, Breakout EBU, facilitated tonight by Derek Schallenberg. We're always glad to see people from all over Ontario joining us for PD in the evening. And I know that you're going to have a, a really great time with Derek. He always puts on a fantastic presentation, always has a lot of strategies and tips, and this sounds like it's going to be an exciting presentation. So over to you, Derek. Thanks so much, Molly. I'm really excited to be here tonight and sharing with you some ideas in terms of Breakout EDU, so hopefully we'll learn lots. And as Molly said, if you have questions, please fire away. You can put up your hand, you can type them in the chat box, and if I miss them, then Molly will help me in terms of making sure you get attention, um, so we should be able to answer all questions tonight. So what we're focusing on is Breakout EDU. And it's the idea of bringing an escape room into your classroom, whether that's to use probably with students, but it could be as well to, to do PD with your staff if you choose to do that. So a little information about myself before we get started. Um, I've been teaching, I don't like to see the number, but it's approximately 20 years in the York Region District School Board. And currently, as in this weekend, finishing the last final pages on my thesis, it's been far too long, and it's focusing on BYOD learning, uh, so basically students bringing their own devices into our school. And currently I'm interested in a couple of things like inquiry-based learning, gamification, which is what Breakout EDU is, actually both of those things, technology and education, and then flexible learning environments. If you want to contact me after the session, you have additional questions, you'd like me to share resources, although we are going to share everything tonight with you at the end, feel free to email me or you can tweet, and, and that's great. And yes, I did coach Molly's son, and he was fantastic. Um, in terms of what we're hoping to do tonight, we have a couple things. So the obvious one is we're learning about what Breakout EDU is. And then more importantly, what I'm hoping is that you'll be able to find ways to apply it in your classroom so that it enhances teaching, learning, and student engagement as well. So we're going to do sort of three stages tonight. The first one is, what are the basics? What comes in the breakout EDU box if you choose to go that route? What are the basic rules and concepts of the games and how educators can use it? Then we're going to consider some reasons for using it when we could use it, and who we could use it with, as well as a couple sort of, I wouldn't call them warnings, but just caveats to consider when you use it with your students. Lastly, we're going to play a couple games. So we'll have a digital version of the game, sort of a sub-game that you might use within your breakout EDU, and then as well we'll review things at the end. So I'm hoping we'll be successful in terms of understanding how it works, and then you can conceive of ways you can apply it with your different learners. So, getting started in terms of what Breakout EDU is, you've got three options in terms of how to bring this escape room into your classroom. So the first one is you can purchase a box directly from the company and they will send it to you whether you're in Canada or anywhere else and it will have everything that you need to apply any of the games that are available and there's tons of them that are free on their website which Mally's provided, www.breakoutedu.com. We're going to go there later, and I'll show you how to access those free games that they have. And if you really love it, you can actually purchase their platform, and it has all their professional games that they've added as well. If you don't want to go that route, you don't want to purchase your own box, I totally get it, I understand. You can either take what you've got in your classroom, your house, etc., and maybe add a couple items, make your own, that'll work. Or lastly, you could also make a digital version of it, which is going to be very cost effective. Um, and I'll show you how you might do some of that. So those are your three options. These are what we typically find in our Breakout EDU box. And again, if you search Breakout EDU on Google, you'll find tons of images in terms of all the different resources that typically come. So what I received when I first sent uh, away for a box was a wooden version of what's on the left here. You'll want the wooden box. If you've got an old chest, like a treasure chest, that'll work beautifully for this. Then we want to have some sub boxes 
that are going to have um, clues and hints in them. Kara, do you have a question? <laughs> do you want to ask away? Oh, you're okay? Just trying out the feature. Okay. So we have sub boxes, and these are all going to be locked with different types of locks. And we have some of them here. So you'll have a key lock, you'll have number lock, letter locks, et cetera. And, um, and then one other thing to keep in mind is you're going to be facilitating this game. Your kids are going to get stuck at some point. So usually there's two hint cards. They have to be unanimous as a group saying, Mr. Schellenberg, we'd like you to give us a hint. We're stuck on this. And so they can get two hints during the course of the game. Then up here we have the hasp where we put multiple locks attached to it, and that gets attached to our lovely box. And then you'll also use things like um, the UV or black light and the invisible ink, and you'll write certain clues wherever you want to write them. So we're going to keep going. These are what the locks actually look like. So I have all of these different ones, and they all come with the, you know, the box if you choose to buy it directly from Breakout EDU. The one here is a word lock, so you can actually choose words. Um, we have number clues. This is a directional lock. And then we have key codes. So these are all going to be important. And you're going to hide different hints around your classroom. And the kids love it. So in terms of the step-by-step -step process, I'm just going to walk you through it. And later, we'll look at a couple of specific games. So the first thing you want to do is, if you were new to this, is you would select a game on their website that was appropriate both for your group's age level as well as the subject area. So I teach high school English, so I would choose Shakespeare or mythology, these types of games. We've done Edgar Allan Poe's poems. We've done lots of different games. So the first thing is to find the clues which they provide for you. You may have to print some of them off. Um, you're going to set the locks for each of the boxes that you have. You want to test the game, whether it's at home or in the classroom is ideal. And what you want to keep in mind is the clues should not be set up in a linear way. So if you have a class of 15 or 20 or 30 students, they're going to be finding clues at different times, and that's perfect. And you just don't want to set it up so that they can't move from key um, for the first box to this clue for the second one. So they're going to be sort of doing it randomly, and that's okay as they move forward. In terms of some other things you want to do, you want to prepare the instructions. What's really, really important is having a backstory. So you want to frame it, is this a zombie apocalypse? Are we trying to find Shakespeare's missing tragedy that nobody's ever read or maybe nobody wants to? Um, the backstory is really, really important in terms of framing the experience for your students. You go through the group suggestions about how you want them to function together, work, collaborate as a team. And then usually you print off these success or failure sheets, or some teachers actually get the students to create them. And traditionally, there's a picture at the end where whether you succeeded or failed, you take this picture of um, your learners after the task. Moving through the other things, we have our two hint cards. We have to have a timer. What a lot of people use for the timer is Breakout EDU on YouTube provides 45-minute timers. They've got like a number of different versions, and we'll give you access to those. You can search them very easily. You plant the clues in your room. You invite students in. You frame things with the backstory. You tell them it. Sometimes they'll even provide you a video, which you just play for them. And then you start the timer. And at that point, what's beautiful, and I think sort of my best classes involve this, is I step into the background as the facilitator, and the students take over. So whether you've got a free-for-all of everybody trying to figure out the clues, or maybe because your group's so big, you've split it up into three subgroups or four subgroups, and you've got teams working on different sets, you back away, they take over. Where you might interject is if they get stuck and they choose to use one of their two hints. And then at the end, students either succeed or fail. You take a picture. We're going to talk about that. And then lastly, they even provide you with resources in terms of 
how to debrief with the students afterwards. Um, so you want them to reflect on the experience, both in terms of how they function as a group and what they learned. This is a typical um, timer from YouTube. So the games are set up so they're 45 minutes. If you practice a couple times and the students actually get through much faster, then you're probably going to want to add more clues, more hints to it to make it a little bit more complex as a game. But you'll get a feel for things if you try it a couple times. Okay, so in terms of before the game is set up, this is the information we want to make sure we give to the students so that they actually, what they have to realize is this is not an individual game. They have to work together in order to be successful, otherwise 45 minutes is not going to be enough for one person to solve all the puzzles. So you want them to work together. They need to communicate and collaborate. Number three, really important, you need to share so that everybody in the team knows what clues you've found. So if you have a chalkboard or a whiteboard in your classroom, free up some space where they can write down the number, the code, the message, the whatever, so that other students can look up, see that, and that may help them solve whatever they're working on. They're going to want to come together every once in a while to review what they know, and then it has to be unanimous, or it's supposed to be unanimous, whenever they use one of the two hint cards, and they're going to ask you and you're going to try to direct them to get them over whatever hump they're at uh, so that they can keep moving forward. So there's a maximum of two typically. So here we have some pictures of different groups, and I think one of the cool things about this is it's for all age levels. So you've got what I assume is elementary kids here in the top. They look like they're very close to um, solving the last little puzzle and opening their box. On the right, again, we have elementary learners. What's interesting is if you look at the computer monitor, they solved the puzzle in 14 minutes out of 45. So probably the next time I attempted the game with that group, I would make it a little bit more complex. I would add some more content in because they can obviously handle it. We've got a really young group in the bottom left here. They're holding up the signs that you um, can print off if they say, you know, we broke out. Um, and then we've got a sort of a PD group of educators over here on the right, and they obviously escaped as well. So you can use it for all different types of learners. Please feel free to fire away with the questions. If I'm going too fast, you want to slow me down, go for it. Okay, so they provide the debrief questions as well. What I would probably do with these is I would compress them, so we have like five or six, and then I would have a mixture of how did the group function together type questions, as well as some of the content. In addition to having a reflection activity, taking the picture, celebrating their success, even if it's an epic fail, we celebrate that too with a picture, I would also have some sort of activity, whether it's either group quiz, team quiz, individual quiz, where they can go over what was the content that connected to the curriculum. And for us, I don't know about you, but none of our quizzes count in terms of our report cards, so we would consider those formative. So what we're going to do now is our first of three little activities. This one's super simple. Um, so I'm assuming that we've used Padlet before, but if we haven't, it's super easy to use. So this link here in the middle, bit.ly OTF breakout we're going to provide for you and what you're going to do is go in there and what I'd like you to do is post at least once with three different ways or times of the year or parts of your unit where you could use it. So is it something where you would use it in the middle or the beginning or the end? Do you have a specific unit that you teach where this would be perfect to kick it off? So what I'm hoping is we'll share some ideas together, and we'll go there as a group, and we can take a look as each person's posting a comment. To post comments, you can do one of two things. You can double-click anywhere on the Padlet, or you can use this little pink button that's in the bottom right, click on it, and a comment will be created. Okay? You can even click on comments with other people's work and give them feedback if you want. So I'm going to click on the little 
uh, monitor sharing button here. And I'm hoping you guys are going to follow the link that Mally's provided in the bottom left, the bit.ly link, OTF breakout. And we're just waiting for things. Okay, so what I'd like us to do is to click on the link at the bottom left, and it'll take you to the Padlet, and from there, we're going to try to type our comments. Okay, so hopefully you can see it on your computer. Um, so what I can see is lots of different um, people writing. The strength of the Padlet is that it's really simple to set it up. It takes you about five minutes. Um, the weakness is you need to know your group of learners really well. So you can see what Laura has done here, which is great. She's provided her name for a comment. Um, but that's something you would have to talk to your students about. Sometimes the first time, they're, um, they have a little bit fun in terms of typing things that might not be okay. So we've got here in the top, we've got use a breakout to investigate and solve questions about invasive species. That sounds really cool. Minds on activity, review a concept, team building at staff meetings, they would love it. Um, it would be great in an FSL classroom to get students speaking and working together. And I checked that, and they actually have games as well that are in French, which is fantastic. I didn't think an American company would have those, but they actually do. First week of school in terms of setting the mood, the atmosphere for your, for your group, that's fantastic. And I agree. We want to probably use this either at the beginning or at the end of um, a specific unit. So I think there's lots of great ideas, and that's definitely when I've used it before. And I love what some people are doing. They're actually commenting on other people's posts, which is fantastic. So I'm going to ask Mally to bring me back. Beautiful. Thanks so much. So what I'm hoping, yes, I was surprised that they have French ones care as well, and that is fantastic that they do. And obviously, teachers have made those and shared them, and I think that's one of the beauty, beautiful things of Breakout EDU is a lot of it's created by teachers. And I think what we ultimately want to get to is if you're using this tool, is to have students design the games. I think that would be fantastic with your content. So. In terms of what's next, before we go and take a look at the actual website, does anybody have any questions about how Breakout EDU works so far? I know we've gone over some of the concepts, the rules, some of the equipment. Does anybody have any questions before we dig into the actual website a little bit? So we're doing the waiting thing, and it looks like everybody's fine for where we're at right now. Oh, here we have a question. So it's a great question. For the digital game, would they all have to have a device? So usually what happens in the normal physical game, the breakout EDU game, one of the pieces which I didn't talk about that they have is usually a memory stick. And so some of the actual puzzles are digital. Um, so usually as part of the game, there's one computer. It could be a laptop. Sometimes it's ideal if you could hook it up to an LCD projector. And then students or a couple of the students can be accessing that while other students are working on parts of the physical puzzle. For the digital game, it could be done in multiple ways. So it could be done where there's one device, or it could be done where you've got a device for each team 
or in some cases it might be ideal to have a device for each person. So it depends on the game. You have to try them out and see which one works. But usually for the digital one, if we can have more devices, then I think it might increase engagement. Even one per table of four or five might be fantastic. So we're going to keep going. And if people have other questions, again, keep doing what you're doing and fire them in the chat box. And so we're going to talk a little bit about this digital version. Um, and they provide tools on their website for how to make the digital version. And we're going to play a game in a sec. Um, but basically what I would suggest is knowing at least two tools, and that would help you in terms of creating your own. So the first one is a website, so a location where people can go online. My recommendation would be Google Sites. But if you are comfortable creating different types of websites, like Weebly or Wix, then you could go for those, and those would be great. So the nice thing about Google Site is it's, first of all, it's simple to use. It's now one of their Google Apps. And um, it allows you to easily embed any of the apps, like drawing or form, right into the site. Very simple, looks beautiful. Um, and it's not difficult to use if you've never used a website creation device before. So Google Site would be the first tool. The second one is a specific app called Google Form. A lot of people use it as a tool for surveys or polls. And it can be used to create your clues almost as locks for each clue. So basically what we do is we choose the short text questions. And we type the question that we want. And then you type in, or you click bottom right, response validation. And it allows you to select the exact text or a number that students have to come up with to solve that particular puzzle. So we're going to do that in just a second. You're going to have an attempt at a puzzle that's built this way. It would be considered a sub-puzzle within the whole breakout EDU game shouldn't take us a lot of time. If we have time tonight, we'll go into Google Form, and I'll show you how to actually do it yourself. It's not very difficult at all. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go into this puzzle. And it's called Pit, uh, sorry, Bitly Last School Day. So I'm thinking that if you're here tonight, you're probably not, I'm, I'm just guessing, but you're probably not thinking of retiring tomorrow or next month or anytime soon. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, but what this basic mini game involves is the premise is it's your last day, and you have to remember to do four things on your last day of school. You've prepared for it in advance. You've written a little, perhaps cheesy, poem that's going to remind you of these four things. And you've also given yourself four visual hints that are going to help you remember what to do. So what I'd like you to do now is to go to the link that Mally's provided. I'm going to hopefully go via my computer. And then I'll show you if we have any questions how to do it. But basically, we're going to read the instructions at the top. We're going to read the poem that's in the Google form. And then I'm going to ask you to try to solve the four things that you need to either bring or do or hand in so that you can successfully retire from teaching, not suggesting that you would want to do this anytime soon. So we're going to go to the website. And it's called Teacher's Last Day of School. And can I ask, Mally, in terms of what you can see, can you see the website on the screen? Yeah, I can see the website on the screen. OK. And does it show if I'm scrolling up and down? No, it doesn't look like you're scrolling. OK. So what I'm going to ask you guys to do is I'll, I'll just read the backstory to you. Some of you have, may have already started, and that's fantastic. 
And so here's the premise. It's your last day of school. Before you leave your home and head to school, you want to check your list of things to remember for the final day. You have four things you need to do, so you organize them into a poem. It's not the most beautiful poem. I'm not Shakespeare. There are also four visual hints below. So, Nicole, I see you're saying I can only see half of the page. So what we want to do is click on the link that Mally's provided, okay, bit.ly last school day, and it'll take you to the website. What you're going to want to do is scroll down, and there's four clues. So we have an eye that looks like it's crying. We have two tickets. We have some open doors, and we have a lovely receipt, which I generated a couple days ago. It's not real. Uh, I'm on my iPhone. That's probably the problem. Okay. And then if we scroll further down, we have the Google Form. In terms of the Google Form, it says, what's your name? And with my students, I would always say, your first name is fine. You could put in another name. That's fine as well. You've got the poem. And then we've got our four questions that you need to solve. So I'll just read the poem. If you cringe, that's okay. The poem says, poem for my last day, the next adventure. I'm looking forward to what comes next. I bought a trip for two. The school owes me a little money. That's one thing I need to do. I'll lock the door at the end of the day. That room I'll no longer go. I'm hoping my last day will be happy, but the tears will probably flow. So each line of the poem corresponds to one of the questions and one of the pictures. So I'm hoping that you'll be able to solve it. Um, and might take you five minutes, might take you two. When you actually start typing in the Google form, it will provide a hint. So Kara's asking, does spelling always matter with Google Docs, like receipt instead of receipt, for example? Oh, okay. So let's see. Did, did perhaps Mr. Schallenberg spell receipt wrong? So, <laughs> right, so what happens is when you create the Google Form, you type in the word, and not only do you type in the word, but it's also case sensitive. So in my hints, when people are typing, I try to give them a little bit of help, like it's seven letters, or you need a capital, or for the last one, I think it says it's a brand name, that sort of thing. Um, so you can type in little hints when you do response validation, and uh, that could help your ESL kids in terms of giving them a clue to help them, maybe no capital or six letters or whatever you want to say. So we're waiting as people attempt to solve the four questions of the puzzle. And if people need help or a hint, so what happens, John? Great question. In terms of the Google form, when you start typing, even if you're typing the right word, as soon as you start typing a letter, the hint magically appears. When you get to the end of the word, and let's say that um, Kara's, okay, Mally can retire successfully. Um, when you get to the end of the word, if you've typed it correctly, then the hint disappears. So students will get used to Google Form in terms of, oh, I typed the word receipts, and apparently I spelled it correctly, and then the hint is gone. So how do they know if they got it right or wrong? What happens is when you're done with the Google Form, you, at the very bottom of it, you hit where it says um, submit, and if it successfully accepts your answers, then you've got it right. 
you could, if you wanted to, to make life more interesting for your students, is have one question on each page. And so they can't go um, forward until they solve the first question. I put all the questions on the same page. It looks like we've got a couple people that solved it. So hopefully, John, I answered your question. It won't let you submit it uh, unless you've got the answer right. When you use Google Form, short text answers, and then in the bottom right, you click on response validation. And that helps you um, put in either a word or a number. Could be a math question, could be a science question. Um, so until they get it right, they're not allowed to submit it. So in terms of people, we've got, it looks like we've got a couple people that have successfully submitted it. So they are retiring. They've handed in everything. They have big smiles on there. Oh, okay. So it looks like we've got Kara, Laura, Shauna. Hopefully I'm saying Shauna's name correctly. Cassandra, John, Molly, and Esther who've all solved it. And what's interesting is John didn't put just tickets. He put airline tickets. But because he's got the right word included in it, it accepts it. So the same thing happened with Molly. She put receipts, whereas everybody else put the word receipt. And it accepted that because it had the right letters in it. So it's not perfect, but you can use the little um, hint to help your students in terms of knowing exactly what they want. And Shayla has also successfully solved it. So it looks like most people have been successful. So if this was a normal um, breakout EDU session, that Google form would be one of the sub puzzles. Just like they're working through small boxes, we would have one computer set up. And as they got the answers from different things, that would help them answer some of the questions. So it looks like most of the group is good. So I think we're going to continue. Mm. Molly, question for you. Can you, like, can you see my screen currently? Yeah, I can see your screen. OK. And but you can't see me scrolling no. right now. And no. So it's like it seems to be frozen or something. I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. OK. Um, OK, it's so. Before, but yes. maybe try it again, because you're going to be, yeah. So do you want me to bring you back to the whiteboard? Uh, sure. What I was hoping to do, since we have time, is show people how to actually create the Google form. But I'm not sure if it's going to let me do that. OK, maybe try. Um, Close that page and then open up. Like, we can try it again. Let's try it again. Okay. I don't see anything happening on your. Yeah, what I see is uh, hosting is paused. Yeah. And a little circle that goes round and round. Yeah. Maybe we can try again later. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. This is why we don't really recommend application sharing because it sometimes doesn't work. Okay. So let's keep going. Um, all right. So in terms of questions, I know you guys are going to type them in the chat box, so we will move past that slide. And so now we're going to take a tour of the website. And as opposed to actually going online and taking the tour, we'll take it via um, the slides. So I've prepared some slides for you guys to see how to access the free games that are available for you on Breakout EDU. So the first thing you would do is, as Molly previously supplied you with, we would go to www.breakoutedu.com. And maybe if we have time, we'll let you explore it a little bit, and then you can ask some questions. Uh, on your own. So if I go to the next slide, when I go to their website, we can see what's in the top left. So it says um, Breakout EDU, and you're given two options. So there's a collage of people playing games behind you, 
and we can see purchase, which we're not ready to do at this point. And then we have the other button, which is learn more. So if we clicked on it, um, what it would do is it would take you to this next slide here, where we've got this picture of these cartoon people. And at the top, it has a number of options, and we would click on where it says games. So we click on games. And now it's taking you to all the different games. And so a recent change is, um, like most uh, things available online, you've got sort of the free version and the monetized version. So what happened before would be you would buy a box, they would give you their password, which would show your work, and that would allow you to access any games online. What happens now when you go to the website is they've differentiated things. So you've got games created by, by the people at Breakout EDU, and you've got games created by teachers. And one thing I will say is in terms of quality, there's no difference. It's not like the Breakout EDU games are much better. That since the games that are created by teachers are teachers who are experts in that particular field, whether it's elementary, secondary, science, English, math, whatever, the games are fantastic. So what you want to look for is when you go to the website, I click on more, and then step four here, it says click on user-generated ELA. So anything that has that blue collage in the back that says user-generated, that means a teacher made that game, and then they were fantastic, and they shared it back with Breakout EDU. So Breakout EDU has posted them for us, um, and we can use them whenever we want. So for me, I'm an English teacher. I go to the language arts games. You have different choices. You can see here as well they have Spanish, French, etc. But I would choose user-generated ELA. That way I don't have to pay for them. And I'll take you to the next slide. So they have tons of different games. You can see nine at the top. You can see nine in the bottom right. And so some of them are different books, different plays. In grade nine, I teach mythology, so this one would work. Great Gatsby, some people are still teaching that book, so that would work. Um, but the one that I would pick for tonight is Fortune's Fool, and it's Romeo and Juliet. It's a game that I've used before with my grade 10 kids. They love it. Um, so I would click on that. So this is what it takes you to. Um, and basically, what you see in the top left is a picture related to the yet. And right beside it, they'll have really important information for you, and that is, who has this game been designed for? Is it high school? Is it elementary? They usually have information in terms of, um, is it 10 to 15 players? Is it more? So what you might do is if it was a small group, but you loved the game, is double up all of the clues and have two sets of them. So team one over here, 10 to 15 students. Team two over here, 10 to 15 students. And they're working through the puzzles, trying to get to the master box that you could have in the middle of your classroom. What they also provide you with is if you click on right underneath the picture, it's got the story. And the story is either going to have a script that you can read to students, or even better, sometimes it has a video. You press play, and the video explains or frames the story for everybody. So we want to access their imagination before the game begins. Underneath, it's awesome. They provide all the lock combinations that you'll need. So you take your locks and you set them. And then on the right-hand side, we've got our step-by-step -step instructions. So this is print on this map, highlight this page, get your, get your deck of cards. You might write in the letters, the words, the clues that they suggest with the invisible ink pen, and we set up the whole room. What's amazing is about all these games is the person who created them, so in this case a teacher, they've shot a video of them explaining how you set up your room. Five, ten minutes, what all the clues are, they walk you through the whole thing, 
And so that's perfect in terms of setting up your actual game. So we've got, you can see here on the left, we got the story, video tutorial, lock combinations, and then underneath the video, there's two things that they provide. Game resources in a Google folder, and then they've also got what's called a launch facilitation tool, which again, you could use for yourself if you wind up creating your own games later. So if I just go to the next slide here, this is what you'll see if you click on the two links that are underneath the video. So on the left here, you don't need to have a Google account. It's open to everybody. Um, these are the game resources. So this is a Google folder. And it'll have some things that you print off, and it may have some clues that you'll be asked to put on the actual memory stick. And when students find it, whether it's located in the box or hidden somewhere in the room, it can on the computer, and then they can access those specific puzzles. Getting a little bit of background noise here. And then the other thing that they have underneath the video is a link to this launch facilitation tool. And what's beautiful about this is you can keep that link and use it for any games you design yourself. And this is digital in terms of uh, it's a link. And it has a 45-minute timer. You can put the music on or off. You can start the timer. It's got a little counter of 0, 1, 2, depending on how many hints they've used. And then there is a link to a Google slide show that has the information students need to begin the game. And then for the picture afterwards, you've got the signs, which you can either print off or you can project them on an LCD projector after the kids are successful. So everything is provided for you. Um, all you've got to do is either A, purchase the box, or B, you can acquire the items by yourself. And one thing that they did have on the website, Breakout EDU, is cheaper than buying it, and it's about 200 bucks, is you can actually individually purchase the components from Amazon. So I'm not sure in terms of your budget. We bought a couple for our English department, and uh, so people use them whenever they want. I also bought one for myself personally. So um, a couple different things in terms of reasons why you might use this for your kids. I'm not going to read all of them to you. If you're on Twitter, though, one thing I would say is the person who made this sketch note is Sylvia Duckworth. She is fantastic. If you're into learning about education, you should follow her. So she's the one who created this, but it's based on the ideas of a uh, talk that she listened to by Maria Galanis. So we've got number one, why do we use Breakout EDU? So a big reason is obviously it's fun. The kids love it. Okay. Number two, it's adaptable to your subject area. There are probably games already that you can use, and then you could take existing ones and adapt them so that the clues are related to the book your class is reading or math or science or whatever. It obviously is providing collaboration and team building, so it's not an individual competition where one person is right and the other people are wrong. One person succeeds and the other people are kind of second best. It develops problem solving, communication skills. They are going to hit some obstacles, so they're definitely going to have to persevere. And then we have some other things as well. So students need to work under pressure to be successful. Um, and I think, as I said before, what's amazing about it is that you disappear as a teacher into the background and the students take over. And it's really interesting to see how they interact with each other, how people assume leadership roles. Sometimes your group can surprise you in terms of who steps up. So um, at our particular school, we've used this uh, a number of different ways. So at the last OSS TFPA day, we used it um, with teachers both from our school, about half of them in the picture. And then the other half were teachers from all around York Region. So we have the opportunity to go visit other schools, or at least we did previously. And you can see here we've got all the clues in the foreground of the picture. This is our library. And then the boxes in the middle. They were successful in terms of breaking out, so we did our traditional picture. Then we've got um, 
something that I just want you to think about carefully with um, a couple different things. So one thing is when we use technology, every school board is different in terms of what they think about collecting student information and especially and more importantly, how we use student images. So when you're using certain tools, digital tools, whether it's Padlet or Google Form or YouTube or Twitter or anything, make sure you understand what the rules are for your specific school board. So at our board, York Region, what they have is something called red tools and green tools. So green are things that are sort of board sanctioned, okay? And then red are things that it's not supposed to be you can't use them, but it is you need to seek permission with your parents before you use them. So what I would not advise is you run out, you buy Breakout EDU, or you design your own games for it, and then you take these pictures and tweet them out and your class had an amazing time, and then you get in trouble for having images of your students online when A, the parents aren't comfortable with it, or B, you didn't ask the students. And the final thing is we probably want to include our administration at some point in terms of what we're doing, depending on what uh, types of tools we're using. So this is my class um, last year. And so in this case, didn't want to put up their actual faces, so they used the little pieces of paper to cover them. So we just concealed our identities, and there might be donuts in the foreground as well, and so they were successful at escaping. I think that was a grade nine English class. And then we have another option for you. So I don't know about you, but um, one way you can take a picture is obviously with an iPad. So it has, there's lots of different free apps that you can use that are great with picture filters. So this is called Prisma, and there's 20 or three 20 or 30 different free filters. I picked one, and so picture on the left, picture on the right. And what's interesting is the students actually know which one is which, but nobody else could tell in terms of which student is Conway and which student is Jackson, et cetera, in that class. So this was actually from September. So that's another way to go. If you want to do the celebration, but you want to protect yourself and your students in terms of their identities. Okay, so a couple things to keep in mind. Um, when we create Breakout EDU or when we use this type of tool with our kids, the emphasis on story to begin is really, really important. Anything you can do with regards to music, lighting, etc., costume, I don't know, to help create the story, they have Halloween ones, I'm sure, would be fantastic. Okay, so that helps them in terms of their imagination really get into the idea that, oh, there is a zombie apocalypse and we have to solve this, otherwise someone's going to come and eat our brains. The next thing is, and this is a warning for Mr. Schellenberg here, we don't want to have prizes. It's not about the prize. It's about that feeling of collaborating, working together. That's the part that we want to celebrate. Obviously, we want to hook it into our curriculum, but there shouldn't be external prizes. That shouldn't be the reason why they're playing the game, okay? And then we want to design puzzles that require critical thinking. It would be fantastic if some of the puzzles are involving some of the things they're learning in your unit, or maybe they're sort of foreshadowing what you're going to learn later in the unit. So they might be hinting at that. We want variation in terms of the types of puzzles. So you wouldn't want just the Google form that I uh, created for you. And then you want to tailor the reflection activity at the end and make it more meaningful in terms of focusing again on A, how did the group function together, and B, how can we sort of, you know, what did we learn with regards to the curriculum. So we're moving pretty rapidly here. Um, I'm going to pause for a second. Does anybody have any questions about um, breakout EDU or any of the things we've seen so far? Anybody with any questions? 
questions about the games that they have, questions about how to acquire the box, etc. We seem question free at the moment. Um, Mally, do we want to take another stab at showing them how to use Google Form or um, the Google Yeah, Play? sure, Derek, it's up to you. Okay. Well, I think there's we got... a question from Shauna. Okay. Um, how much does it come to when you buy the thing separately on Amazon? Um, okay, so that's a great question, Shauna. So as I said, I think before, I believe the game in total from Breakout EDU is around $200. Um, I think the price they quote initially is an American fund, so you have to do a little uh, exchange rate there. Um, but if you buy it separately, you could probably save almost half of that money from Amazon. The other thing is a lot of those things in terms of, you know, boxes, decks of cards, books, that sort of thing, you can, like I've added two things for my little package of goodies that I use based on some of the things that I have in my house. So that's a great way to add and sort of extend it and make it more fun. And you don't want to be pulling out the same clue. So I have like fake dictionaries that actually have locks inside. I have boxes where there's like three separate little secret boxes within them. So you can sort of add to things as you go. But you're probably looking at 100 for Amazon, 200 for Breakout EDU. Is one enough for a school, Nicole? So that's an interesting question. We did PD um, two Septembers ago for just the department heads at our high school, and they all loved it, and they're like, yes, I need one for my specific um, department, that sort of thing. And one person offered to build them. It didn't really happen. For us, I bought one myself, which I use all the time, and I bought two for my department. That's enough. You know, because I think with a specific class, you might use it one, two, three times a year. Um, you wouldn't want to use it too many more times than that. So probably one to start would be fantastic. Um, yeah, I mean, hopefully your school can offer those funds. Yeah, one per grade would be great as well. I think the key is, is um, sharing some of the ideas with the administrators so that Obviously, you know, the school is paying for them. There you go. Yeah, that would be great if you could come up with one per grade level. Okay, because we've got lots of time, I think what we'll do is see if we can do a little sharing here, and maybe I'll show you guys how to create that Google form. Um, before I do Cara's question, how big are your groups? Normally, do you find it successful in full classes? So I've done this with um, adults a number of times. With them, it's usually 10, 15. It's fantastic. The group that you saw at the library, I think, was about 20 people. And so I added more hints for that. The first couple times I tried it with my high school students, I waited for those field trip days where half of them went to the zoo or or half of them went somewhere, and so I had a group of about 10 to 15, and that was perfect. Once I got comfortable using it, then I added to my arsenal of different types of clues and sort of doubled things up. For a class of 30, which I have, I would split them probably up into maybe three teams of 10 and have a central box and then have puzzles that each group needs to figure out and maybe they're the same puzzles, but they're in different sections of the room. I've done it with a class of 30 adults at a summer institute session, and, and they loved it. So I think it can work with any size, but you definitely need to prepare in advance. What you don't want is five or ten students who are doing nothing, obviously. That would be not good, okay? But definitely if you double or triple up the clues, then I think you can, you can have any group do it. So we're going to try this monitor sharing again, and maybe we'll show you how to use Google Forms, and um, we'll see about Google Sites. Not sure about that one. So let's see if this works.
So I'm clicking on application sharing. And you guys can see the website, but you can't see me scrolling. Yeah, this is not great. So, Mali, if I click web tour, it won't let me um, show them how to create a Google form, I'm guessing, right? Yeah, that's just, um, that's just if we're showing a video or something. For some reason, mm -hmm. it doesn't seem to be working unless you open a try new browser, Derek. Okay. Yeah, so I'm in Safari now, but I, all it shows in terms of the hosting is that it's we've got this lovely cycling effect. So I don't think it's allowing me to actually show me working on the screen. Let's try this. Okay, so I don't think it's going to allow me to actually. I just saw and I hear what you're seeing saying instead of it's um, that you know how to use Google Forms. So what I was hoping to do was to show people how to use um, the sub ability to just sort of not only create types of questions but the response validation to show people exactly how that worked or to show them how to create Google Sites. But I don't think it's going to let me do that. Um, so I think then we'll go to the Kahoot, if that's okay, in terms of reviewing some of the key information. The question here, Mally, is going to be, um, they'll be able to go to the Kahoot, but they'll only get the four colors, they won't get the screen if I can't share my screen with them. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, maybe I can share my screen. Will that help? Um, if you're the one who's running the game. Right, I'm not running the game. If you use, if you use that link that I gave you that has the, you know, the PD one, mm -hmm. then you can run the game if, if you can show your, if you can share your screen with them. Okay, let me go to that link. Kaboom. I have to sign in. Okay. Do you have to sign in to use it? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I, can we share the screen with another, with another computer? Is that possible or no? Can I? I yeah, don't have another computer available right now. I do though. Sure, I need you can try. I'd have to make that. I, I I'll make your second one a moderator. Just hold okay. on. Yeah. Oh, that might work. Okay. See if that one works. We're trying to be. Thank you, everyone, for being really patient. Um, technology, as we know, isn't perfect. So is this your second computer, Derek? Yeah. Can you see the screen? I can see the screen, but nothing's happening. You're still on that teacher's last day. Right, okay.
So on this screen, you can't see the Kahoot loading. No. No. Okay. Yeah, we'll go back and try it one more time. There it goes. Okay. How does it work now? Is it okay? Mm hmm it's working. Okay. Sorry, right. everyone. Here it goes. Okay, so what we're going to do is to this little Kahoot. This is obviously Big Bang Theory. They're going into an escape room. You can see the pin at the top, so it's 319865. Before we start playing, Shannon, I'll just answer your question. So presently on the Breakout EDU website, you do not need to create an account in order to view user-generated games. You should be able to see them um, without having to generate an account. Now we've got a person named Breakout who's joined us tonight. Okay, so I think we have most people. We'll wait maybe 10 more seconds and then we'll start. So Laura's just joined us. So, of course, if you played Kahoot before, if there was a word or name spelled by someone that you didn't like in terms of one of your students, you could always click on it and remove that student. Um, so again, we have the challenge of not knowing everybody's name unless you specifically ask students, please put your first name. So we're going to start, assuming that everybody's in. Okay, so I'm going to go start. You have 10 seconds for each one. So in this case, the answer was a game where players cooperate to solve a complex puzzle. And so we have a lovely picture of our learners who have obviously been successful. And I think what we have to keep in mind is, I don't know if we had seven or eight people, so it looks like four were able to successfully answer in the 10 seconds. So 10 is probably pretty fast. Usually when I use Kahoot, we might use 20 seconds, but I was just wondering about time for tonight. So Cass is currently leading, but she's closely followed by two other people. Okay, so we got more people successfully answering, and this one speed would have been really good because all answers were correct. So we have a new leader on the board. Only one right answer for this one. Beautiful. So we know 
One thing for sure is that it's 45 minutes long. Hopefully the timer was a bit of a help. We talked about which Google app tonight. Okay, beautiful. So Google Form, we want the short text question, and then we want to choose response validation. We want to remember it's really finicky, so it's case sensitive. And apparently Esther is on fire. Okay, so we had two possible answers that were correct. Okay, so the first one is we give them suggestions on how to work as a team, especially sharing the answers or hints that they come up with, any clues. We want to make sure that's public. And then the backstory is really important in terms of framing things. And Sandra is leading. What should you do once the game begins? Okay, so one thing, of course, we never want to do when we have students in the class is leave the classroom. So printing off the signs would be a bad idea. Marking some recent assignments might not send the right message. Take random pictures and put them on the Internet could cost us our jobs. So we want to start the timer, observe the fun, and then occasionally we might help them if they have questions and they want to use those hint cards, which are supposed to be unanimous. Okay, what happens after the game is finished? Okay, so picture is taken. Traditionally, countdown timer obviously is going to stop at zero, or you're going to stop at wherever they finished up. Make sure you do the debrief questions to consolidate the learning, and then we want um, to celebrate, even if they're unsuccessful. The fact that they tried and were unsuccessful, that's positive, and we can work with that. Three questions left. Three answers are correct. Oh, sorry, three, two. No, you can make a digital version of the game. Okay. No, you can buy or make the components of the game. Absolutely. Yes, you have to buy the kit. No, you don't. And certainly with us, we live in Canada and we've had no problem. And in terms of the picture, I think this is what we want to do when we have a big group of learners. So you've got 30 kids in the class, 24 kids in the class, whatever. You probably want to have three teams, blue team, red team, green team, and away they go. Two questions left. Okay, so all the answers were correct. That's great. And again, we have Sylvia Duckworth's beautiful drawing. She does them for everything that she attends, which is fantastic. And if you're following Anybody on Twitter, you'll notice that sketch noting is like really in the last year or so. All the answers were right. And we have our leader, and we have, I believe, one question left. When could you use breakout edu in your class? Okay. So could be used to introduce a unit or concept. Great way to kick things off. Um, to introduce a course or theme right at the beginning, to review a unit of study, and reflection of a course or a grade would be great. And I think what we, hopefully, if we attempt to use this tool, is we eventually move to the students actually designing part or all of the puzzles. Wouldn't it be amazing if you had four or five units of study and at the end of each, they design a game that consolidates some of the key learning that was done? I think that would be fantastic. 
and we have our winner. So it's Shay and Kara, and we have Esther coming in third. And if I wanted to, I could get the results, and I could save them to my Google Drive as well or download them. So again, because this is, this is a great tool, Kahoot, but you probably want to tell your kids, let's just use first names, okay, in terms of data collection and that sort of thing. So since I think we have time and I think this is working, what I'll do quickly, I know some of you guys are um, familiar with Google Form, um, but what I'd like to do is just really quickly show you guys how to use that response validation. So even if you don't want to create this full-on breakout EDU game, you're able to um, create your own puzzles for your kids. So here's Google Drive, and see if I can find the one that we used tonight. Doesn't really matter. Okay, maybe we'll just create one from scratch. So I'm going to go to New, and I go to More, and I click on Google Forms. And the first thing I do is name it. Otherwise, it can disappear. That would be bad. And if I wanted to make it pretty, then I would pick something from the color palette up here. And I need to have a nice little image connected to it. Okay. So the first question I would usually ask when I'm using this tool is, what's your name? Which is great. And Probably, since my questions are so important, I'm always going to make them required questions. So I'm going to click on that. And now we're going to just play with response validation. And you can use this for anything. So for example, what do you have to give to the office before leaving on your last day? Okay. Again, I'm going to make it required question, so they can't move to the next section without completing the question. And instead of multiple choice, we're going to change it to short answer. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go to the bottom right here, where these three dots are, and I'm going to click response validation. It used to be data validation, but they changed the name of it. And if I want a text-based answer, then I go to this first drop-down arrow, and I click on text, and I leave it contains, and I type in the word. So I want, let's say, keys, okay, to be the word. And then here I can give my hint. So I can say, for example, four, four letters, and starts with a capital. And hopefully that will help people doing it. And then what I always want to do before I actually attempt it with my kids is I want to test it out. So I go up to the eyeball here, and I want to preview it. Okay, and so we have what's your name, so I type in my name. And then I'm thinking, hmm, what do I have to hand in? Let's say I put in book. Well, book's not the right answer, so the hint starts showing up, four letters, starts with a capital, okay? If I type in keys, it's the right answer, but because it's case sensitive, it won't accept it. So I start typing in the right answer, and now it will let me submit it. So it will only let me hit submit if the answer is actually correct. So response validation hopefully is really easy to use, um, and we use it for puzzles to start off units or lessons all the time where the kids have to figure out, you know, four, five, eight, ten key ideas, key words, maybe key terms that are part of what we're learning, and then we can move on to the rest of the lesson. So I'll just hit submit. Okay. So that's Google Form. Do we want to see how the Google Form goes into the Google site in terms of how to use that, or is that too complex, or is there something else you'd like me to show you? Any thoughts from the group? 
Okay, Shauna. All right. So in terms of the website, again, websites in Google used to be really, really difficult to use, and then they changed it and made it a lot easier. So instead of having to go to a separate place to create my website and choosing all these complex features, I now just treat it like a normal app. So I click on New, and I go to More, and it's down here, Google Sites. And it's very simple in terms of its appearance. Again, the first thing I would advise that you do with any Google app is name whatever you're doing. Okay, so I name it, and I could put something here. I like this capitalized for some reason. And over on the right, I have different options, and it looks complicated, but it's not. They only have a couple themes. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six. So I can pick one theme. I can change the colors based on what they have. And we've got only three options in terms of the text. Some people think it's actually too simple to use, but I think it's great. Um, and the kids find it easy to use as well. So that's fantastic. So the next thing I want to do is I want to take that Google form that I made and put it here. So when I double click anywhere on the Google uh, site, this little circle comes up and I've got five options. So I'm going to click from drive. And what it should have is the most recent things that I've done. So here's a couple things that I'm working on. Um, here's my shared with me, which I don't want to use. And then we have our recent options as well. And there's my lovely Google form that I just made. So I click on it, and it appears. The first thing you're probably going to want to do is just resize it. I want to make sure it's big enough so that people can see the whole Google form without really having to scroll down. Okay, and then if I want to, over here, I can change the background color. I've just got a couple options. And what I want to do next, uh, it's almost ready, um, is I need to publish it. If I don't publish it, then I can't share it with anybody else. And so the first time you publish it only, you have to give it a name. Use only lowercase letters, numbers, and dashes, so it doesn't like my brackets. So that's fine. So now I've named it. Now I can publish it. And again, before I would share it with students, I would always check to see what it looked like. So what I need to do is go up to this little eye and just preview its appearance. Okay, so here is my website. I've embedded the Google form. What I would do next is I would probably go back to it and keep editing it and I would add some instructions in terms of what the kids are supposed to do with it. So I would go click on text, and I would type in my instructions for whatever they're doing. And I can play with the font and that sort of thing if I want to. OK. And then I probably want to put my instructions ahead of the Google Form. So I need to just drag them up. It'll let me. Yeah, there they are. Okay. So there's my instructions in terms of what to do with the activity. And then again, last thing I want to do, it's still saving it, so I'm not going to lose anything, but I just want to publish it. And then I can either view the published site. Again, looks good. And now I can use this link and I can share it with the students or I can embed it in whatever you guys are using with your students, whether it's Google Classroom or Moodle or whatever type of platform you're using. 
Okay? So Google Form is super simple, and I think, honestly, Google Sites is also super simple to use. Anybody have any questions about any of those things or how Breakout EDU works? Anything you'd like to ask? Hi, uh, Derek. Maybe you could, uh, Shannon was looking for the user-generated games on the Breakout EDU site. Maybe can you show them to? Sure, something? absolutely. So we'll go to Breakout EDU. And if I can spell it. Okay, and we're going to click on Learn More, and then I want to click on Games, and so these are the subject packs, which are amazing in terms of, you know, if I go into math here, it says 95 games pre-constructed. And it is asking for, oh, yes, okay, so it's asking for this. Now, it doesn't require me to pay for anything for doing this, so I'm just providing them some information. Okay, so now I'm in. So to answer that previous question, you do have to make that little initial login with it, but you don't have to provide any information beyond that, and you certainly don't have to give them any money to access it. So here we have the 95 games. We can see that we've got five groups, so algebra, pre-algebra, geometry, foundational math, and user-generated math. Now, if I go into anything except for user-generated, so if I go into algebra, and I've forgotten any algebra I learned probably, um, these are all games made by Breakout EDU. So if I go, if I click on this, it's going to ask me to obtain a platform access code. I have to pay to do this. I'm not going to pay to do this, so I don't choose to use the games that were created by them. However, they have been very nice, and I think it makes sense. All of the games that were created by teachers and given back to the site are still, you're still able to access. So there's 67 math games here. So if I click on it, we have all the different ones. And I can actually type in here and do a little search if I want to, which is great. Um, and so if I click on one of them, I'm not sure, let's see. Alien Fuel Pod sounds interesting. I know you're screen is probably adjusting while I go through this. So what I love is on the right-hand side, we've got recommendations in terms of, okay, so it's a small group, so maybe that means approximately 8 to 10 people. This is a high school game, so that's helpful to me. And Algebra 1 functions, domain, and range, that's what we're going to focus on, and it is for 45 minutes. So if I scroll down a little further, we've got the story, okay, and it looks like it says intro video and then there's some initial information. And then they've got their lock combinations, so that takes me a couple seconds to reset my locks. Then we've got the video that's created by a teacher, which I won't play for you. Not sure how that'll work if I do. And then at the bottom, we have the two things that I was talking about. So we have access game resources, which should be a Google folder. So they've provided everything that you need. Okay, so it looks like you've got three Google Docs, one Google Slideshow, there's a link to videos. And if I go back and look at the instructions, it'll tell me where I need to put these things in terms of what boxes to hide them in. And then I can go to my launch facilitation tool once I'm ready, and I can start the timer. But before I do that, I'll probably set up the introductory presentation, and I'll choose what I'm going to do with the signs. Am I going to print some off? Am I going to put one on the LCD projector? But that introductory presentation is a Google slideshow, and I'll go through a couple slides. I don't want to bore the kids too much. A couple slides with the kids, 
and then we'll try to set the mood in terms of the game and emphasize that story. Okay. So, okay. So we've got a question here. Can you filter for elementary level appropriate games? So I'll just try. If I go back out to games, and let's see if we type here elementary, what happens? Okay, so it looks like it's given me only elementary games. If I open one of them, let's see, a force to be reckoned with. Okay, so it says recommend ages elementary. This is for a whole class. I'm assuming that's somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 30 kids. Interestingly, this is 40 minutes long, and we've got the content area. So that's great. I didn't know that it could actually filter for that. Let's see if it does the same for secondary. Ooh, that's interesting. Elementary, but not secondary. Okay. All right. Any other questions that we have? Anything else you'd like me to show you? John, do you have a question? Um, can high school students access the phones, uh, sorry, the Google sites from their phones? So we have a couple of um, things that we use with students that are websites. They can access them with their phones. I don't know um, in terms of how they look. I would imagine the appearance changes. I think when you saw me creating that Google site, there are three window options at the bottom. So it automatically chooses, whether it's a phone or a tablet or a computer, how to configure it. But in terms of seeing what that looks like, I've never seen it before. Um, Nicole, see you later. Thank you. Uh, would Chromebooks act better? Absolutely. Chromebooks would be fine. They work just as well as most um, laptops or netbooks in terms of, of being able to see things. And the beautiful thing with what we're using tonight and what at my school we typically use is everything exists online. So the nice thing about a Chromebook is I can't download anything. We design our lessons that way so that no downloading is required. So for Google Apps, a Chromebook would be perfect. Any other questions people have about Breakout EDU or Wanting to see anything else on the website? Want me to teach you some more Google Apps? Whatever you like. John, do you have another question? No problem. They'll all, they're all available as well as the Google Slideshow. So you can take it, you can make a copy, you can adjust it, and there's lots of different things there um, that you can access as well. So, and speaking of that, um, tomorrow you'll be getting another email with a link to the recording for tonight. So you'll be able to go back and review things if you want, and also a link to all the resources that Derek um, has shared. So that'll come out tomorrow. So I think that's probably it for questions and things. Okay. And I know people are um, um, probably wanting to get on the, to, to rest. And it was that was great, Derek. That was really cool. I'm One glad things, things worked out.